this series is, I call it HDR potpourri, um, a little bit of everything. We've historically had themed HDR webinars, uh, meaning uh, one webinar would be on architecture, one webinar would be on that grungy urban exploration type of photography, and another one would be nature and landscape. Oh, I found that it was more fun to just kind of switch from uh, genre to genre because it shows versatility in the uh, what you can do. So instead of limiting it and having to offer, you know, make you have to come back to different sessions, let's have, we'll have these sessions go on and on. We'll just do different images uh, across the same uh, technique of high dynamic range imaging. So what is HDR? Well, let's just go. Let's just immerse ourselves. Um, HDR is, it stands for high dynamic range. And to understand HDR, you want to understand what this dynamic range is. Um, what What is dynamic range? It, it kind of correlates to the tonality of the image or of the scene. The tonality is um, what you have from the darkest parts of your image through the mid-tones and onto the highlights. And our cameras, our digital cameras, despite being so powerful and so fast and so smart, are limited in how much of that information they can capture in any one exposure, in any one frame. So historically, let's just look at this image here. I took this image last week. Um, I was in Seattle visiting my good buddy Jacob, and he he had been wanting to shoot this bridge called Deception Pass. Um, and we drove out. It was about a one and a half, two hour drive north of Seattle. And we got there with plenty of time to spare. And this is a great kind of tip that uh, Jacob and I kind of reaffirm for ourselves as photographers. Um, make sure you give yourself ample time. Um, there's nothing wrong with having, you know, a, to drive two hours to a destination to get one shot. As long as you give yourself enough time to scout um, and, and just analyze what you want to do. So we got here. We knew we wanted to shoot in this area for sunset. Um, we had the place pretty much for the most part to ourselves. So that was really nice. Um, so I was just futzing around with different images. But to tie it back to HDR, if you would, if I was to stand here and not ha know what HDR was or not know how to properly kind of use it, I would have this image here. And it's a good image. I mean, uh, for the most part, we've got good tonality. But you can see that we've got this total uh, loss of information here. And you can see that it's represented by the histogram. So here's your histogram. And if you go from left to right, the way the histogram works is the uh, information in your shadow area will be represented here more on the left. And then you start going into your midtones and then your highlights, which are uh, represented on the right. Now you can see that on the right here, it kind of blasts way up. And that means that we've got a loss of information. There is no information in this area. However, watch this. If we go to an earlier photo, you can see that we've got good information here. And Ron says that this bridge is about five minutes from his house. That's very cool, Ron. The area itself is, is beautiful. Um, so what does this mean? Well, we can do several things. Um, we could take, say, this image and this image. I'll just put them side by side. That's not what I wanted to do. This and that, and we'll compare them. So we could, you know, use Photoshop to do some sort of exposure blending. We can use perfect layers and try to get some of this sky here. But the problem is that um, the blending is not always um, very good. Like we can take both of these images here. Let's um, let's take this image and that image, and we'll, let's just try to send it to perfect layers. And let's see if we can blend them, because this is a good example of historically what you could do. So I've got my lighter background here on its on this upper layer, and I've got um, the darker layer here. So all I want to do is paint out, using my masking brush, this area here. So I can start painting. Now let me bring the opacity up of the brush so we get more of the detail. The problem is that, watch, as we go towards here, you kind of start getting a little bit of a bleed from the uh, lower image. And this is one example. This will work on other examples, but for this particular shot, what you have here, you see how we're getting restoring sky. That's great. But when you get to these edges here, like the trees, 
it's really hard to get behind them without darkening the image. And so you're going back and forth with um, painting in and painting out, and this can be uh, frustrating. So what can we do? Well, we could uh, apply HDR. So I'm going to close this out. I'm going to delete the PSD that was created. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this uh, image for tone mapping. Now what tone mapping does is you take these series of brackets. So I've got these brackets here, starting with the uh, brackets exposing for the highlights, for the brightest parts of the image. And watch, as we start cycling through, you can see that we're getting more of that mid-tone information. And then as we go further and further, we're getting shadow detail. So here we've got some shadows here, shadows under this uh, petrified tree and through the tree line. So those are our brackets. What we need to do now is somehow take all of these exposures and on a pixel by pixel basis, compare them, find which ones are the best ones, and then kind of uh, maneuver the sliders within your product to get the best results. So what we can do here is we're going to use a variety of, of tone mapping products. Actually, a variety, we'll probably use just two. We're going to use HDR Express and Photomatix to, so I can show you the differences between the two. Um, so I'm going to select these images, and I'm going to right-click and go to Export, and then go to uh, Merge and Edit in HDR Express. Now, I'm working in Lightroom right now because I prefer Lightroom um, as my image manager. Uh, but you can do this wherever you work. Ken asks a good question. Ken's question is, what are your increments between shots? Um, they're actually one exposure, uh, one stop increments. So minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. And that um, allows me to get kind of the widest range. I could do two stops, but I don't really, I don't normally feel comfortable doing that. Um, if it's a very low light shot, I might increase my, my uh, exposure increments to two stops. But for now, one stop is what I historically do. All right, so here's HDR Express, and you can see that when it comes in, um, it's nice. You can see right off the bat we've got better exposure detail here. So what I like to do is um, I like to start working on the sliders, but I want to show you you've got this image range here, and it shows you that you've got about a 10-stop uh, range in tone. And so I'm, if I hit play, it actually I kind of like this. It, it actually plays through. I wonder how it'll look. Nah, you know what, I just watched the recording. It didn't look as good, um, but it actually plays through all the exposures so you can see the 10 stops of exposure information. Now what we can do is we can start fiddling around with the sliders. And so th there is, I don't do many things in batch. In fact, I don't, I don't think I do anything in batch um, ever. Other than importing my photos into Lightroom, everything I do is on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. Now this may not be the most effective uh, thing to do, but I'm not, you know, in the industry anymore like I used to where time is of the essence where I need to get, you know, as many images churned out as possible. Especially with HDR and especially if you're new to it, I do recommend that you don't do anything in batch. Treat each um, exposure or each image rather separately. And so what we can do now is we can start kind of adjusting brightness and contrast and highlights. So here, as we bring the highlights up, the highlight um, slider up, there's actually a highlight recovery slider. And there was a question earlier by John asking whether I ever use the recovery slider um, in Lightroom. Uh, not, you know, sometimes it, recovery will help kind of wrangle back any high uh, ex or high um, highlights, you know, really, really bright highlights. But watch what happens. Let's pay attention right over here as I use it essentially the recovery slider. In fact, let me see. Let's zoom in a bit. Okay. Watch what I'm going to do. As I start recovering highlight information, you start to get a little bit of a this weird cast around the image. And if we go back out, it just looks very hazy. It is effective because if you bring up the highlight recovery, and it, it's kind of the opposite, this slider here. If you bring it up, um, it, it you almost lose highlight information. Or rather, you, you're, it looks like it's getting a little bit hazier. Whereas if you bring it down, you can see how that highlight information is brought back or the clipping is brought back. So you, you don't want to do apply this too much. But typically, you can use the brightness slider in tandem with it. These two sliders, I feel, go hand in hand uh, very well. Um, then what we can do is we can start adjusting shot shadows. Now here's an important thing with HDR. One of the chief, um, I don't know, complaints I guess, or, or uh, crit 
criticisms of HDR is that it often you lose um, shadow detail. Like you can see here's a shadow, but you actually see through the shadow pretty well. The shadow slider basically will help you mitigate that. Except if you bring the shadow slider to the right in HDR Express, it actually uh, kind of brings out detail that are, that's in the shadows. So what I want to do here is actually drop it down. I want more shadow detail. Contrast is something that you really want to pay attention to because it's not traditional contrast. It's more like what we call local contrast. And what this does is it actually boosts texture. Now, if you boost it up way too much, in my opinion, it, it degrades the shot. So you want to be careful with that. You know, you don't need that much of it here. You can always add texture after the fact. Saturation. Um, this image is a bit too saturated for me. So I'm going to drop it down a bit, and I'm also going to cool it off. So here we have a good exposure. In my, in my opinion, this is a good exposure. I'm going to hit Save, and let's just save it as a JPEG. Okay. So there is my HDR image. Now watch. If we go to one of our normal exposures, you can see that in the shadow information, it's pretty... Um, it's pretty open. It's not like it's very, very dark shadow. So if we select these two images and let's zoom in, what we can do is burn this area just a bit. Shadows are are something that you want to pay attention to. Um, I know that the whole one of the you know main things about HDR is that you bring out detail, but really it's also about making it as realistic as possible. So I, this is something that I will look at. I will look to see what the qualities of the shadow areas are. Um, so it's pretty easy for us to actually bring that information back in, the shadow information. The, so there was a question by Buddy about, or not Buddy, rather, by Scott about the color fringing uh, in the left area. This is one of the problems of, at least with, with HDR Express or with any product that you try to do this highlight recovery, is you get that fringing. Um, it's it's a byproduct. Now, what we could do is, because the information is for the most part the same here, like the exposure information, we can find an example of a sky that we kind of like, um, and we could try to blend that part in at a low opacity. Uh, that's something that you definitely can do, but just for for overall purposes because I'm what I want to do first is I want to stylize at this point but we could go back here let's find a good exposure that has some decent information in that mountain range or in the background see that's the problem if we try to mask in one of these exposures it will not match up with the overall look here so what we could do is try to do some sort of um, Exposure blending again. Now that we have a more well-rounded image, the uh, the differences when you blend in will not be as great. And we can try that. Let's try that right now, just as an example. Um, let's find a good shot here that has good sky, something like that. All right, we'll take that one and that one, and let's send it into perfect layers. And so what we're going to do here again is we're looking to blend in the sky a little bit to kind of get rid of that little fringe that we've got. So in this case here, I might drop my opacity pretty low and then start painting out with my magic brush. And that's doing a pretty good job, actually, of blending in some of the fringe that we have, especially uh, on the top of the tree line, without really um, darkening it too much. Now, this is an iterative brush, meaning with the, with the masking brush, because it's at 31%, as with each stroke I take, with my Wacom tablet, it kind of will compound on it. And you can see if we um, we can show our mask here, this is where we're painting. And so as we paint on it, you see how it gets a little bit darker. So it has mitigated a little bit of that fringe without really uh, blowing out any of the areas. So let's go here. We can actually hit File, Save, and we'll update that PSD file that was created.
I see questions coming in and I will address them once we finish at least working on this image. All right, so where was that PSD file? There it is. All right, so this is our combined image. Now, what we can do is we can send this to Photoshop if we want to do anything fine, or we can continue working in Lightroom and just bring it into Photo Tools. So here, let's do this. Let's first start using Lightroom, and we'll just use the spot uh, brush, the healing brush. Now, the way I, I got to it is I hit the Q key on my keyboard. Um, and just to show you, if you hit Q key, it'll bring you there, or you can go to the Develop module in Lightroom, and then this little icon here that looks like a, a circle with an arrow pointing out of the right side, that is your clone and heal stamp, and you can change the brush right here. Clone will actually just mimic pixels, and heal will actually uh, sample the pixels and textures uh, in the surrounding areas. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make my healing brush a little bit larger and just get rid of these dust spots. That's typically the order uh, in which I process my images. I first tone map, then once I have my tone mapped image, I'll start doing dust reduction. Because it makes, it, for me, it's not efficient to do uh, reduction on nine images or seven images uh, if I can just do it on one. Now what I can do is um, I can actually just access Photo Tools right, up, right from Lightroom. Now Photo Tools is one of those products that you need Photoshop installed, but you don't need to be in Photoshop. You can go to File, plug in extras and then go to photo tools and let's stylize the image. So here what we're going to do is let's edit a copy of the image. We'll save it as a PSD file and let's keep it as a TIFF file. I want to maintain my Pro Photo RGB color space because that's what I'm using now. I'll just stick it as an 8-bit image because I'm not this is not an image that I will go into production with. I'll I'll work on this separately. And then we can stack it with the original. So let's hit open. And what it'll do is it'll automatically launch Photoshop if you don't have it launched, but it'll launch Photo Tools right off the bat as well. Laurie, Laurie I see your question. I'll address it in one second um, because it's a good question. So here we've got our image and we've got Photo Tools. Now Photo Tools is uh, my favorite product in the Perfect Photo Suite. I use this all the time. Um, and it's a collection of effects that you can apply to your images. So the Im the effects are broken down into categories. You've, you've got them over here, and the categories are self-explanatory. If you're shooting a portrait or you're working on a portrait image, you'll probably want to focus on this portrait enhanced category. But in this case here, I'm actually going to go to the stylized effects category, and I'm going to start working on some of this stuff. What I want to first do here is, and this is something that I preach pretty often, is that I'll look at the image here, and I'll look at the different elements. Like I see here, this area, uh, the rock, this is during golden hour, without a doubt. The, it's just this beautiful, warm color. We were really lucky in the Pacific Northwest last week. The weather was just superb for the most part. So what I'll do here is I'll start, um, I might add a little bit of sun glow overall to the image. Because what that'll do is just, it'll kind of soften the highlights. It'll give it a little bit of a nice um, glow. I'll also drop down the strength. You'll see me do this with every effect. I always bring my strength down to zero um, with this fade slider. And then I'll bring it up until I'm happy. The next thing, that I'll, and that's probably one of the only effects that I'll allow to uh, apply to the whole image. The next thing that I'll do here is I'm going to see just off the bat what Golden Hour, Hour Enhancer does to my image, especially here. Now this might be too strong for you. It might be way, way too warm, and it is. But even at small amounts, about 16%, it does give it a nice, pleasing, uh, warm cast. However, I just mentioned how that I don't really want that golden hour enhancer affecting the rest of the image. I really only want it affecting uh, areas that have this cast on it already. So what I can do is I can hit this invert mask button, and what it does is it kind of hides the effect. It doesn't remove it, but it just hides it. And what this lets me do is select my masking brush, and then select my option instead of painting out. Think about it. If the golden hour enhancer was applied to the whole image and I didn't want it in the sky, I could just paint it out of the sky. But because I inverted the mask, meaning I hit it, I can change from paint out to paint in by clicking. Now I can choose where the effect is applied. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to brush it here on this rock wall. I'm also going to brush it here on the front of this petrified tree because it has a, a 
that cast on it. And I'm also going to just brush it right here on the bridge because the bridge has um, a nice cast to it. Okay. What I'll also do is I'm going to add, um, if I go to the, um, where is it, the tinting treatments, and then this first option here, tint with clean whites, you can see these various color uh, swatches. I'm going to select this light blue one and I'm going to hit add to stack. Because what I want to do is just cool off the sky just a bit. And you can see how it applied to the whole image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust here. And now that I'm looking at it, I'm not really happy with this effect. It's almost muting out the blue. So what I can do is if I want to remove that effect, I can hit this minus button under the stack and it just removes it. I can remove any effect anywhere in the stack by hitting the minus button. If I want to start over, I just hit reset and it'll wipe everything out. Instead, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to uh, my filters, uh, my photo filters, and I'm going to use this cooling filter here. You know how they say the common expression is, you, you know, there's always more than one way to skin a cat. And that's true with photo tools. With photo tools, there are various effects that will give you slight nuances um, in the overall result. And it's really fun to kind of play around with that, figure out what works for you and what doesn't. So here, the cooling, again, not really digging what it's doing to my sky. So let me remove it, and the last effect I'm going to try is under stylized effects, and it's an effect I use pretty often called cyberpunk. Cyberpunk adds a nice kind of contrast to the sky, and again, we can kind of drop it to zero and bring it up just a bit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to invert the mask. I'm still in my painted mode, so now I can just paint it in. I'm not really too worried about you know how neat I am. And I'm just going to paint it in the sky. What I can do also is I can show my mask. And what that does is it shows if you've missed any patches, which I did. So I'm just going to fill them in with my stylus to make sure that I don't have any kind of splotchy areas. I'm also going to paint it into the uh, water because I, I do think that Cyberpunk does a wonderful job with anything that uh, is made of water. It just adds a nice, very, very kind of metallic blue uh, uh, tint to it. John asks a great question. Uh, John's question is, does the order of the effects in the stack uh, affect the appearance? It's a, it's a great question. It's a really, really good question. And the answer is, unfortunately, yes and no. I say yes. Well, let me say no. No, because ultimately the effects will compound on top of each other in the same way. Yes, though, because um, depending on how you stylize, depending on how your mind's eye works, you're looking at this image. If you added, say, cyberpunk first, it might change or bias the way you apply the next effect. So, no, technically it shouldn't, it won't um, affect, you'll have the same outcome. But for me, I, I kind of know that I go from the warm to the cold, to the cool. That's how I operate. When I get my temperatures down in the different parts of the image, um, then I'll start going with tone in terms of uh, shadows and highlights. So here, I hope that makes sense, uh, John and everybody. Um, it, it's really how you attack or your, you approach the image. So I said, and I've taken care of this image here for the most part. I am not a fan in these kinds of beautiful nature scapes, I'm not really too big of a fan of going wild with stylization. Meaning, other than maybe converting this to the black and white, I probably wouldn't do too much to, to mess with this image because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful shot and I want it to kind of stand on its own. I use the HDR to give a kind of representative baseline image, meaning it's a good exposure. This is almost as if I was standing here myself. And then I'm using photo tools to just kind of tweak it a bit. What I want to do here is um, I want to apply an effect to kind of darken the shadow area. And so there's an effect uh, new to two, Photo Tools 2.6 called Just Enough Darkness. Now, when I add it to the stack, I'm really only paying attention to the shadow areas. I'm not really looking at the rest of the image. So I'm going to start at zero, and I'm going to bring it up until where I'm happy. And remember, we saw those rocks in the shadows. So um, it's not like I need it to be black. And what I can do here is invert the mask and start painting in that shadow information. Just kind of darkening the, that part, like get the shadow here, um, a little bit over here in this branch, 
uh, you know, just kind of give it a little bit of depth because that's what it's doing. It's, it's giving it some nice depth. Get it right here uh, on that rock there and just a strip under the trees. Other than that, I'm not really going to affect the shadows anywhere else. So you can see if we hit this none, I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, but you've got this uh, these uh, tabs over here. If you hit none, it hides the bar. And then if you hit Command-0 or Control-0 on a PC, it'll fit the image to screen. And let me see if there is a... Um, I don't think there, there is. Okay, so if you go to View and go to Fit to Screen, that's the way I got to it, Command-0 or Control-0 on a, a PC. But what we can do now is just toggle the previews. You can see here, again, not... A, gr a great difference, but it is, it's subtle but effective. So here we can hit apply. And I'm going to try something here. I actually didn't try this before, but I, and I'm a big fan of experimenting live with you guys uh, on the webinar. Let's actually go here and let's, um, let's wait for Lightroom to get the image brought in. So here is the image. Here's the, the just the tone mapped image, and here's what we have with um, with Photo Tools. And now let's go here, go to File, Plugin Extras, and let's go to Focal Point. I want to see maybe adding a little bit of a radial uh, or circular focus bug on the bridge, because that is my focal point. So here, let's do this. Let's change this to a TIFF file. Again, um, Focal Point is the only product currently that supports smart objects. So if you wanted to convert this to a smart object, you could. Uh, I'll maintain my color space. I'm going to change to 8-bit, uh, and I'm going to work on standalone. Um, sta Photo Tools and Mask Pro are the only two products that require Photoshop. Um, all the other ones are uh, standalone, meaning you can run them without Photo Tool, without Photoshop, um, even launched. And buddy, I, I did not uh, answer your question yet. Once we're done here, I will definitely answer it. I'm gonna. Once we're done here, I'll go through the existing questions we have. All right. Let me reset our settings in, in uh, Focal Point and just acclimate you to the product. So Focal Point is um, a product that allows you to kind of change your plane of focus uh, and give you a more shallow depth of field. And you can do that by using this focal point, this uh, focus bug rather, this little critter. Anywhere you, anything inside of the bug is in focus and anything outside is out of focus. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just kind of make the bug small and I'm doing that by tugging at the legs. And I'm just going to kind of put it here. Now I know this looks awful and that's true, it does look awful because <clears throat> we haven't done anything to the image yet. <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring my feathering up. The feathering controls the um, how gradual the in focus to out of focus area is. And then the easiest way for me to show you that is if I hit this over here under the focus brush palette, if I hit show mask, watch what happens if I bring the feather to zero. You see how there's no transition? So if I hit hide mask, it's a hard line. We don't want that. I'm going to bring the feather to 100%. And what that does is, I'm going to show the mask, it creates um, a very, very large uh, gradation from the in-focus area to the out-of-focus. And this is good. Now I can reposition it. And what I'm going to do here is, with focal point, I'm a big fan, I preach this a lot, very little goes a very long way. What I mean by very little is by this amount slider here. This amount slider controls the amount of blur. So if I jack this up, I mean, it goes crazy blur. And you can see how it's rendering. I typically don't operate in very high amounts. I'm usually um, no more than, uh, no, I'll very rarely go above 10. But I'm usually hovering between 3 and 4. Because, trust me, the viewer's eye will register that the bridge is in focus and that this is out of focus. So what I'm free to do now is refine. You can see at three, it's very, very subtle. We can probably even go to two. I'm gonna just type two in here.
And what I can do now is really tighten the bug so that's very, very close to the actual shape of the bridge. Now, I can actually use my brush here. We've got, you remember the brush we did in, in Photo Tools? We called that a masking brush. In Focal Point, we called it a focus brush because what you're doing is you're painting focus in or out. So you can see here that on the left side of the bridge, if I zoom in a bit, you can see that it's slightly out of focus and I don't want that. So I'm going to select my paint focus option and I'm going to bring my opacity way down. It's already at 27% and I'm fine with that. And what I'm going to do is just paint strips until I get the area in focus uh, to the desired amount. I'm going to make sure that this whole area, the under part of the image is also in focus. And by doing that, we're kind of making sure that the eye snaps to the bridge. I'm also going to draw this area here on the right side of the bridge, of the, uh, yeah, of the bridge rather. Make sure you get the top part as well. Now because I'm at such a low opacity, unfortunately you can't physically see what I'm doing, but I'm going back and forth with my Wacom uh, tablet, you know, picking it up and putting it back down to make unique strokes because it's compounding. And then you see this area right here, it's kind of in focus and I don't want that. Um, I want it actually slightly out of focus. So I'm going to change from paint focus to paint blur and I'm going to bring the blur amount even lower. I want it to paint it in very, very small amounts. There you go. That's really all you needed. You want to, When you're painting blur in, guys and girls, be very, very mindful at the opacity of the blur. Bring it down. Bring it way down because what will happen is it will not look natural. Here, I'm going to zoom in just to give you an example. So watch what happens if I paint the blur over here. What happens is it kind of, um, it, you'll have a spot that's blurrier than the rest of the, the image, and you don't want that. Okay, so let's bring this back. So now we can start to see how the bridge is really in focus. The rest of the image is out of focus, but in a way that's tasteful. Let's just draw another strip of blur right there. Okay, that's good. Now what we can do is let's drop the brightness of the surrounding area. The way the brightness and the contrast sliders work um, is it'll affect the brightness and contrast of the blurry area. It won't really, watch, if I bring the blur way down, you see how it's not really affecting the, me the, the focus bug? That's because we want the, one of the best ways to kind of bring focus is to adjust brightness and contrast. Brightness and contrast, is, those are classic ways to draw your eye somewhere. Where you have vignetting, vignetting where you darken the edges, that's another classic way. So let's bring the brightness up a bit. We don't want it that dark, obviously. So here we've got the brightness down, we've got the contrast up. Um, and Scott's asking what bridge is this? Is this, I believe, well, this area was called Deception, Deception Pass. Uh, so, and I, it's, a, it's a park. It's a, a state park or a national park, but it's in Washington State uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Here, this is a bit too dark, so I'm going to brighten it up just a bit. And then now what we can do is we can add a slight vignette to the image to darken the edges. So here, watch, here's the before. And now here's the after. I go straight to it. So let's hit apply and I'll show you what we can do as a last stop in uh, Lightroom. And this could be done in, in Aperture as well. Let's go to the grid. There is our updated image. And now what we can do is this. First, I'm going to rotate the image because it's slightly, uh, the horizon is off. So I'm just going to rotate it. Uh, and I'm basing this as my horizon. So we've got that. That's good. And now what I can do is I can um, get, go to my adjustment brush. And I've got a brush here that I saved called an HDR texture boost. And what it is is it's a boost in um, contrast, a slight boost in brightness, uh, a boost in clarity, and a boost in, in uh, sharpness. And what I can do is just paint it on the bridge. And what that does is it helps snap the bridge uh, in focus. Ron says it's called Deception Pass Bridge and it connects the 
Fidalgo Island to Whidbey Island. And this is the, I think the San Juan Islands, Ron, right, Ron? Um, if I'm correct, or it's on the way to it. But I could be wrong. Um, okay. So here's the image. Here's, here is what we were able to do with HDR, with uh, photo tools, with focal point, and with Lightroom. Um, I, I really like the results. If it's too punchy in terms of saturation, one of the nice things about Lightroom, or a nice cool little trick, is drop the saturation and boost the vibrance in equal amounts, or sometimes a little bit more vibrance. But it does a really nice job of adding color um, in a slightly different way. I'm going to boost the saturation back up just a bit. So here's what we have. We can also boost the clarity overall, and we can also boost a little bit of that contrast. But I'm really happy with this image uh, using HDR. So before I go on to the next image, what I want to do is address some of the questions that we have here. Um, David at the beginning asked, when I shoot HDR, do I use mirror lockup on my 5D Mark II? Um, only when I'm in a low light situation. Um, when I'm in a, this kind of a situation here where there was plenty of ambient light, I didn't use mirror lockup. What mirror lockup does is it, before the camera actually starts exposing, it flips the mirror up and what that when the reason why you would do that, especially in a low light situation, is even the action of the mirror slapping up can cause a tiny micro vibration, and that could be enough to uh, bring your image from tack sharp to just a tiny bit soft. Um, so in in night exposures or low light exposures, yeah, I'll set the mirror lock up to on, and that way I have to hit the exposure button twice because the first the first fire will slap the mirror up and the second one will activate the sensor. Um, good, It's a good process. Uh, John asks if I ever use um, the recovery slider. I think I answered that sometimes, but again, it's at the risk of, here, if we use the recovery slider, this is the recovery slider in um, Lightroom. If we bring it up, you can see right here, you can see this kind of weird fringe that occurs. I don't like that. So by removing the recovery slider, you want to be very careful about that. And look for that, guys and girls, in the highlight area of your image. That's where you'll see that fringe. Um, can you? So Buddy asks, can you use the same technique when the pics are shot in RAW? Yeah. So Buddy, the reason if you've got eagle eyes, um, I you see that these are all JPEGs. I convert these to JPEGs, actually lower res JPEGs for the webinars because they um, it speeds up the process. But I shoot everything in RAW. So, yeah, absolutely you can do this in RAW. Um, do I really shoot in, H in 8 bit? Stu's asking. No, uh, for the webinar, I do. Um, everything I do is RAW, coming into the, cam into the computer from the camera, convert to 16 bit TIFF um, because I find that's one of the purest file formats. And it pretty much lives as a 16 bit TIFF. Um, except for or up until I need to output it. So if I need to put it to the web, I convert it down to a JPEG, um, usually 900 pixels at 72 uh, PPI. Um, Ron, I'm going to share your answer with everyone. Ron gave a nice answer as to the details of this location. So it should be in your questions module, everyone. Um, Tapas, I was waiting for this question. Um, asks when you, f how do you expose three, five, seven, nine at one stop intervals? I use a product called the Promote Control. I brought it up in the past, and I can show it to you at the end of the webinar. Um, Canon cameras limit you to three exposures. Um, so there are several ways to to use a Canon camera to get more exposures, but. Um, I just use a product called the Promote Control. It's it's not the cheapest product in the world, but it, it I've used it for two years now, and I love it. All right, let's see. Let's go to the, this image here. I want to skip. We're going to go from a um, more of a landscape image to more of a kind of a combination of landscape and architecture. I saw I was driving. My friend Jacob and I were actually driving to the to this location here, to this um bridge. We were on our way, and I was crossing over this really large bridge. It was right next to some casino 
Ron, I don't know if you would know the name of it, but there is this like casino right over this bridge over here in the in the back right. I see this area here. I see that it's pretty much open access. No one was there, and there were no fences or gates or anything. So I asked my buddy Jacob to pull over, and I'm going. And I and and we spent this time at this bridge. This is kind of like a rotating uh, tra train bridge. And I learned actually about two hours after we got here that this is very much functional because it rotated and a train came speeding by, which was I actually got some cool shots from that. Now, this this um, example actually takes into consideration two techniques. The first technique we're going to talk about is HDR. The second is long exposure. Now, this first image that you see here is a long exposure image, single image. 52 seconds, you can see that the uh, EXIF information shows that it was at F22 um, at 52 seconds using my 24 to 70 uh, lens. I also had it at ISO 50 to kind of, I wanted to maximize the amount of time the exposure needed, primarily for the water. That's all I cared about was the water. I didn't care about anything else because I knew everything else would be under uh, HDR. So you can see that the water has this really nice uh, motion quality to it. It's almost glassy. And I can show you, in addition to the promote control, I can also show you the filter that I got uh, to get this effect. It's a 10-stop neutral density filter made by Lee. It's called the Big Stopper. Actually, um, Laura, I just saw Laura, so Laurie is saying, you know, Vincent didn't convince me to copy CR2 files into Lightroom. I did. I actually reverted back to using CR2s after having a very long conversation with Vincent Versace over sushi last week. It's funny you bring that up. Um, I do use CR2 now. I don't use DNG anymore. Um, it was a pretty epic debate, and in the end, I felt he his argument was better than mine. So, and we can go into that uh, another time, maybe on Friday. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you here. This is my long exposure for the water, and then here are my brackets. And it was a pretty bright day, and you can see that there's a lot of shadow detail. And so I'm just kind of cycling through the brackets, getting the information here. And John and Ron confirmed that they, I do believe, is the Swinomish Tribe Casino near Anacortes. Um, yeah, it's literally. When you come down this bridge, it's if 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 you were standing right next to me and did a 180 degree turn, the casino is right behind us. So and there's like a little RV park or something where people can park there, I guess. But it was great because we were there. Um, and actually, what was cool, just a little story, is when this tr um, to to kind of contrast the northeast mentality towards photographers, which is where I'm from. I'm from Brooklyn, um, and the Pacific Northwest, which is the, kind of the opposite corner of the country. If I were to do this, I mean, without a doubt, if I were to shoot here, say this was a um, a train line uh, in the Northeast, and and someone saw me, I would I would, without a doubt, get get in trouble. Police would probably be called. I could probably get arrested. It's just the way it is. Very reactionary. In the Pacific Northwest, I'm shooting here. The bridge rotates. It connects, and I see a man coming by, and he's wearing a yellow jacket, which it, clearly he's a some sort of official. And so I walk off the, I was standing on the tracks right over here. Actually, I was standing dead center of the tracks doing a, uh, uh, you know, shooting straight down. And he walks across and um, I, I jump off and he's like, he just waves at me. He says, hey, there's a train coming in about 10 minutes. So you, want, you want, might want to prepare because it might be a cool shot. And I was, my jaw dropped and I, I couldn't believe it. Um, so I actually uh, got his information uh, and, you know, we'll send him a print when all was said and done just because the shot I got was pretty cool. I was really happy with it. So that's neither here nor there. This is not story time. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a different product. Let's use Photomatics. I'm going to send it here and let's go to export and here's an important point to make. I'm going to go to the export dialog first. Not to show you that I'm obsessive about how many export presets I have, but when you install Photomatics, you'll have this option here, Photomatics Pro. Now, notice, the, this is what will, the settings that will be used if you send your image to Photomatix using this effect or this preset. It will send it as a TIFF file um, with no compression, 16-bit. You can change this. What I uh, want to 
bring out the point is the color space. In Lightroom, you can choose which color space you want to use, and Lightroom uh, recommends Pro Photo. It's the newest color space format. If you send your images over, it will actually use, it will change the color space. So I created my own preset here that is the, a duplicate of this preset, except it has the Pro Photo RGB color space set. Now you can change this to any other format if you want to send it to J JPEG. It actually converts down to JPEG with Photomatics, which I'm not too keen about, but that's the way it works. So if you want to make sure that you're consistent with your color space, pay mind to the export module. Just go here, change it to Pro Photo if that's what you work on, and then hit Add, and then just save it as your own preset. So what that, mean, what that allows me to do is now I can right click, go to Export, and then go to My Photomatics, which is what I labeled. I'm going to turn off the align images because it's um, it was on a tripod. I'm going to automatically re-import, and I'm just going to reduce chromatic aberration. I'm not going to do anything else. Let export and let it do its thing in Photomatics. All right. So here's our image. One thing that I always recommend uh, users who do use Photomatics do is bring up the histogram. You can do that by going to View and then select 8-bit histogram. And the reason why I say this is because it tells you good information. Like, you should be able to see that there's a little point here on the right that's popping up. That means that somewhere along this image, we still have some blown highlights. So the reason for that is, in, I don't know why this is the case, but um, the white point is way up. And so what we want to do is drop, oh, before we do that, let's work on in the order that I work on. I always, in this case here, I want to bring my strength up to 100%. Next, after that, I'll start uh, working on um, the white point and the black point. So if I drop the white point down, you can see that we've instantly removed that blown uh, area. And I'm going to, I usually kind of start around the same point, just as a matter of baseline. Now what I can start doing is adjusting the light smoothing. Now the light smoothing is what will give you kind of the overall uh, tone map look. The HDR look. Um, the reason why so many people get really poor HDR exposures is because usually they're in this if this mode here called uh, lighting effects, and they're on this. W now, this actually to <laughs> to be, I forgot that I'm running a uh, a beta of a new version of Photomatic, so you will actually see high to low, but they changed the labeling to be surreal, but inadvertently people don't realize that you can actually turn this off and use the slider function which will give you much more realistic results. I never really go below negative two so I'm gonna be here right around negative one. Now I can start adjusting for the actual brightness and contrast of the image. So your gamma is your brightness so I'm gonna bring that up. I'm also gonna bring up the luminosity which brings out shadow details and I'm gonna bring up the detail contrast. And here you kind of play around with this until you get a happy result. It's a bit too saturated, so I'm going to drop the saturation. Let me bring up the gamma here. Bring up the white point a little bit more. Bring up the black point. And I'm just looking for a nice even exposure. Okay, this is about good. So here we can hit save to re-import it. This is not a public beta, uh, Lori. This is a, a private beta, so it's not available yet. Um, all right, so here is the image. Now, what I want to do just for comparison is I'm going to send the same exact images, and we're going to go to um, HDR Express because I want to see. Let's do a, a taste test. We'll merge and let it do its thing. Let me see if there are any questions. The contrast lighter in Photomatics is that the same effect as the HDR Express contrast light? Um, in the newest version of Photomatics, they've relabeled it to Detail Enhancer. The Detail Enhancer in Photomatics, which is currently in the public version of Photomatics, that's the same, or give you relatively the same effect as the contrast here. So here, you can see that right off the bat, this is a bit more of a natural result. We can adjust the brightness. Um, there's not much highlight recovery that we need. Uh, shadow information, I'm going to drop down a bit. The black point, I'm going to boost up a bit. 
contrast, very little amount, I'm going to boost the texture. Saturation is good, but I'm going to cool it off a bit because my images tend to run warm in HDR Express. I might brighten it up just a bit more. Okay, now let's hit save. Just put another character there. Now let's do a, you know, a taste test. Here's image one, here's image two. Okay, so the image on the left is, I already forgot which one's which. <laughs> Let me see here. This is photo, this is HDR Express, so the first one's HDR Express, and the second one is um, Photomatics. Okay, so a few, th let's, and, and everyone, I am, uh, I use the right product for the right image. That's how I am. Um, there have been definite times where Photomatics has given me exceedingly good results over any other product. So the key is to kind of learn what works and what doesn't work. In this case here, I do think that HDR Express is a f is, gives me a far superior result than um, Photomatics. You can see that the sky is much clear, cleaner and that um, it's just more of a realistic, evenly exposed image. So let's conclude here and what I want to do is I'm actually going to use perfect layers because what I want is to get the water replaced with the long exposure. So I'm going to select both of these images and go to perfect layers and let's actually get the water in. Okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the this uh, bottom layer with the water. Um, actually no I can just do it like this I'll just use the paint out feature. Let's bring the opacity up, um, bring the feather down a bit and the size, and just start painting in. And what we're doing is we're getting a nice kind of, oh, you know what? I should just bring the opacity up to 100% because I don't want to deal with the um, having to paint multiple times. So you can see that it's, that's why, um, you want to make sure that you get the right tool, not only in the software, but in the hardware as well. If I didn't have that 10 stop filter, I wouldn't be able to get this long exposure. And again, I'm just being really kind of hasty with the drawing. If it bleeds over, I'm okay with that for now. But I want to show you that it's important to kind of know what you have. So I spent a minute in the field. Granted, a minute's not that much time, but I was freaking out because at any time I was worried that someone was going to come by and tell me to leave. But I spent that minute making sure that I got an exposure just so that the water was um, glassy. I'll just paint over the stock, I'm not really worried. So now we have um, a, a, what's looking like a very cool exposure. You know, I want to just clean this up a bit just so that we don't have a halo from exposure 1 to exposure 2. All right. Now I can go to File, Save, just to merge those two exposures together to a new PSD file, which automatically gets exported or imported back into Lightroom. So here's the image we can start working on. So in this image here, let's try some different things out. Let's send it to the Photo Tools, and let's start stylizing. So the first thing I'm going to do here is let's bring our categories back up so we can start working on the image. Let's apply an effect that will boost up the green in the grass. If you do a search for the word green and actually type it correctly, you'll see that there's an effect called green enhancer. And it's under the photo filters. It, when you select an image, it gives you some it gives you some good information, specifically what category it's in. So I'm going to add to the stack and I'm going to just start at zero. And what it's doing is it's boosting the, kind of like the saturation of the greens. So I want that to pop out. But I don't want it applied to all the greens in the image. So again, invert the mask. There's nothing wrong with just using uh, effects for very small portions of your scene. So just inverted the mask and changed the paint in. And now what I'm going to do is just paint in uh, the areas of green that I want. And I'll just paint it right through there. 
the next thing that I'm going to do is, let's see, I want to do something with this wood. I'm trying to think what's a good effect that we can use. Um, let's see what Autumn does. If we go to Stylized Effects and apply Autumn, now again, I'm just looking at the wood. It affected the whole image, but I'm not worried about it. And I kind of like what it's doing to the wood, so let's drop it down and just bring it up a bit here. Now again, if we invert the mask and paint in, just kind of paint in. Now this can take a while, actually, because I just thought of something. Like, What if we bring this in here? This would take forever, but I'm trying to think if we painted a different effect on the rail itself. That would be something I would do, um, you know, when I'm working on an image without having hundreds of people watching me. Uh, but and that was a bad stroke. Let's pretend that I painted everything. What I want to, what I'm showing you is, I kind of want to try this out. Let's go to paint out and remove the effect just from the rails. And this is how obsessive I tend to get when I'm working with photo tools. Now let's add um, something like Cyberpunk again. Because uh, Cyberpunk works well on water, but it also works really well on metal. So I'm trying to see if it does anything well. Let's invert it and let's see. Because what I'm looking for is to create contrast between elements. So here, yeah, this is working kind of cool. If we just paint the effect on the rail itself, you get a nice contrast. It really pops off of the, um, the rail ties those wooden beams. So you just kind of just, and you just paint it down all the way through. Now the cool thing is, is if it's too blue for you, you can adjust the strength and it'll only affect what you drew. And so you just kind of do the same thing with this uh, rail tie here. And just get it all the way through I know it's kind of sloppy, but I hope you see, you know, you kind of see where I'm going with that. Um, now I'm trying to think what else we would do. I might go to the photo filters and use a neutral density filter. The cool to warm neutral density filter or um, just the graduated. And let's add it to the stack. What that'll do is it'll darken the top part of the image here. I'm just kind of what it helps uh, to do is draw the eye down through the frame. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I might apply just enough darkness. Drop it to zero. So here if we see our original image and then our after image we can do even more, but I don't want to go too crazy with it. Um, so I can hit apply here, let photo tools do its thing, see if there are any questions. Laura is asking if I always make something a shade of blue in my image. Um, I do a lot of times. <laughs> uh, to be fair, I do because um, blue and, and kind of gold or blue and yellow, just they're very pleasing uh, contrasting colors. Um, and blue is one of the few colors I could actually see um, without a doubt because I'm red, green, colorblind. So let's see here. Scott's asking a great question. It's totally fair. Scott says, you know, I know you work for On One, but have you used Nix HDR Effects Pro? Absolutely. I have it installed. Um, I, uh, I will, there's no, you know, us and Nick, we're actually, we're good friends. Um, and I love the guys over there, and they have some really, really kick butt products. No question about it. Um, HDR Express or HDR FX Pro is um, is a great product, especially for those that are into presets, because they have these really awesome presets, um, and they've got these little U point uh, technologies that allow you to kind of control specific parts of an image. I personally, I don't use it very often. I'm, I'm pretty much between HDR Express and uh, and Photomatics just because those two products give me what I need. Um, now there was a great question also, um, I'm trying to find who asked it, as to whether HDR Express is an on one product. It is not, and it's an important distinction that I want to make, is that HDR Express is a product made by Unified Color, and we kind of uh, partnered with them a couple, maybe a month ago, to just to promote them. 
but it is their product very much so. We don't own it. We don't have anything to do with it. Um, but it's, I feel it's important to be able to show you different technologies. Um, no, Lori, unfortunately, uh, Lori asked whether I watched RC Concepcion's webinar earlier today. I saw it was there um, and I helped promote it, but I didn't get, I, I was busy um, during the webinar. So I'm going to catch it on the, on the, uh, on the recording. Linda asked that. So Linda was wondering whether HDR Express is a standalone product or a part. It's you can access it within Lightroom, HDR Express, by just like I did by taking multiple images, say you know these images here for instance, right click, go to export, and then oops, go to merge and edit in HDR Express. You can do that. Um, but um, it's a product in and of itself. It's a standalone product. It's a separate product. You have to pay for it separately uh, from Lightroom or for the from the Perfect Photo Suite, for that matter. But one last thing I want to show you really quickly, and I appreciate that you guys are are sticking around, um, even though it's past the hour. I, I love doing this stuff. But um, let's find that finalized image. There it is. What we can do is again one more time. Let's go to focal point. I cannot stress how much fun focal point is when it's used in moderation. Let's hit open. Because I want to do is I actually want to I'm going to reset everything so let's reset the settings. I'm going to change my focus bug shape from round. You can see it's round because the body is circular. Let's change it to planar, and now it's a square. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make it horizontal. Put it up here on the bridge because that is my intended focal point. And I'm just going to drop the amount again way low. About three. I'm going to use the focus brush to paint focus so I can restore this little bit up here because that's kind of out of focus. And let's drop the brightness a bit, boost the contrast. Actually, what I might do is if I show the mask, I'm just going to paint. Um, the entire top of the image in focus because there is no sense to have that sky out of it's a beautiful sky. Oops. Let's hide the mask. Okay. So you can see how it's just kind of like a cool little let's add a little bit of a vignette. Just really draws the eye to the bridge, but it doesn't scream fake. So let's hit apply. You could, Gary, ask, what about making the rails in focus? You could. Uh, I thought about that. And actually, Gary, when I first worked on this image, I was working on this image. Uh, I was on the Amtrak going from Portland back up to Seattle. Um, and I originally did that. I masked the tracks in focus, but it just didn't seem right. Um, it didn't feel right. So I, I kind of just kept the bridge that this uh, as my plane of focus back here. Um, but it's a good call, Gary, and it's something that I encourage you to try. Um, I just didn't want it. it. To me, that would look, I know this kind of sounds weird, and tell me if it doesn't make sense, but it, it would sound too manipulated. Um, just doesn't, it wouldn't jive. One thing I would also do, just again, to show you the obsessive compulsiveness of, my, of when I process, see this bit right here, whatever this garbage is? That's very bright, and that's something that's very distracting for me. Um, I want as little as possible to distract me from or distract your eye from going from here to here. So I'd probably go to the develop module and again go to the uh, healing brush. Let's place it right there. That does a nice job. I also might try this. I haven't tried it in Lightroom, but let's see if I select that and I kind of position it so that it matches up. That does a good enough job. Like that would not be noticeable. But whatever I can do to remove any distractions, I also would probably go here to my adjustment brush, select saturation, so that's the mode that the brush is in, bring it to 0%, and just draw on this yellow. And that kind of desaturates the yellow from that strip. The train shot's not on my website yet, Scott. Um, 
it's not finalized. I actually just a lot of times with the webinars, I like to um, show like work on images that no one has ever seen. Like no one's seen this image yet, um, except for you guys. And it's just something fun to be able to do with a, a you know a crowd who's really interested in it. Moving the clouds. Ah, you know. Okay, David. David's saying, what about um, um, asks like, can we move the clouds? Um, in this image, it might be very difficult. It might be very difficult because, and I'll show you what I would do. Um, I would take the image. We could take it to Photoshop. Let me um, send it to Photoshop. Oops, cancel. Let's edit a copy of it. All right. So what we can do is, hmm. I'll I'll work on this example here for you in the top right. The reason why it wouldn't work too well is because you've got the clouds through the bars. But we can take the lasso here and just draw around the clouds. And what you can do is if we zoom in, let's zoom in a bit. Let's zoom out. And then um, go to filter, blur, radial blur. And then what you want to do is change your blur method from spin to zoom. And then move the, the, this in the direction of the movement. So in this case here, the clouds are moving from lower left to upper right. So I'm going to take this center and I'm going to kind of put it here. So you see how it's kind of going from, or rather, I'm sorry this way that's the motion and let's hit let's bring the draft quality to best let's bring the amount up so you can see what I'm talking about and so you can see how that's giving motion now here let's undo that and let's just for the sake of argument I know a way around this I'll show it to you in a sec or I'll tell it to you in a second but let's just say we try to do this here we try to kind of draw around these elements that are moving And again, sloppy job. Oh, man. I thought I started up here. Let's just do that one more time. I'm just, again, I'm just drawing a selection around the bridge and around that thing on top and not take care not, not to select the, um, the mountains. Now, again, we just go to filter, radial blur, deselect. So it's doing a cool job overall. I mean, you, I probably would drop the amount of blur. I did it high just so that you can see it. But you can see how some parts of it are in motion. And then you've got, if you zoom in here, you've got this kind of weird um, border. It doesn't look right. What you could do is you could mask out the sky using something like mask pro and by doing that what would happen is you'd have the sky on its own layer so if you guys want to stick around we can do this really quickly if you guys want to try it out let's try it out very very quickly um, let's go to history let's just bring it back to the original now I actually have some sky images on a oh, where was it it's on a my hard drive here uh, solo, no, where is it? It's on mobile. West Coast trip. No, I'll find it in transit. Here it is. Okay. So I was in around Seattle. I just want to find a, just a sky image so that we can mask it in. Here we go. I do this a lot. I actually take images of uh, like sky images here. All right, let's um, let's open this up. Okay, so we've got this image here. Uh, I'll tell you something. The Pacific Northwest is crazy in terms of uh, this the clouds that you guys have. It's awesome. Let's uh, let's drop it in here. Let's duplicate this layer just so that I have a separate layer. All right. So watch if I drop the opacity you can see um, the sky image or if we just go here you can see here's the sky so uh, again I'm gonna drop the opacity of that layer and then I'm gonna go to this layer with the sky I'm gonna go to hit I'm gonna go to edit and then hit free transform 
you zoom out. Where's my, where are my bars? Oh, this is a really large image. Oh, there it is. Okay, that's what I was looking for. All right, so I'm, all I'm doing is I'm just transforming the sky so that it fits in that upper portion of the image. And I'm actually, I'm kind of happy that I'm compressing the clouds like that. All right, so here, let me um, commit this. So what you can see here is we've got, if we turn off the layer, there's the, sky, the clouds. Now, if it's, too much, if it's too small, just drop it down. Well, let's just keep it like that. That's fine. All right, bring the opacity back up of this layer, rather. Create a layer mask. And now let's go to Mask Pro. And what we'll do is we're just going to mask out that background. Now we might have some trouble with the with the um, mountain range here, but for the purposes of this example, I won't be too specific. The way we're going to work in Mask Pro is we're going to select the colors that we want to protect. So it's these colors here that I want to protect. The colors I want to remove are these shades of gray and blue. Now let's see what happens if we have the magic brush and we start removing. Let's hit five so we get these. All right. So you see how we're able to kind of draw past all this stuff. And I'm just going to do something in a second really quickly. I'm just going to take a flat brush, draw an outline. of this. Now I could take my bucket, fill that in. Oops. Hmm, this is blowing up in my face kind of. Because I'll show let's just do this. I'll show you for the purposes of this, of what, what I'm showing you. Let's just say we did a beautiful job with that mask. Oops, I didn't want to save the workspace. I wanted to actually save and apply. Let's pretend that we did a great job. My point is because we've got the sky on its own layer, so let's actually um let's go here to this image. Let's free transform it. Let's just say that we had the sky in its own layer. Because it's on its own layer, I could, I could actually go um, to the filter menu, go to blur, go to radial blur, and again, let's drop it down to maybe 10. We can apply the motion to the layer that has the clouds. So here, the clouds have cool motion. And if we turn it on, because it's unfortunately, the mask is not very good, but we can Let's move it around a bit so we could find a cool area. Here now we can kind of just use the a masking brush. Uh, black and then just kind of start masking in this area here. I'm doing a very sloppy job, but you can see how because that layer was on its or the sky it's on is on its own layer, you can manipulate that layer, use Mask Pro to create your mask and then you have the best of both worlds. Okay. Uh, John's asking whether there's a free transform in perfect layers. Yeah, there is, absolutely. Um, it's. Let's just close out of here for now. If I were to just send this into perfect layers, I'll show you. The free transform is this move icon. And so the, it, let's say you had a sky on its own layer. Let's pre just pretend this sky was on its own layer. You can actually just um, uh, you know, adjust it as you need to. OK. Uh, am I going to submit this on YouTube, Larry? Yep, it's going to go on YouTube now. Yeah, let me, let me show you the, the products I talked about. Terry just brought that up. Let me hide this. So the first product that I talked about was the Promote Control. 
You can learn about the promote control if you go to uh, promotesystems.com. And here's the promote control. I'll put it in the chat module for you guys right now so you should see that. Um, promote control. HTTP, promotesystems.com. All right, so I recommend checking out B&H. They actually sell it for cheaper, I think, if you want to buy it. And then the second thing is the filter. So I went to, if you go to twofilters.com, I use twofilters.com, for, for, but you can order this from anywhere. Um, if It's called the Lee Big Stopper. So if you go to the Lee link, you'll see in the yellow box here, it's called the Lee Big Stopper. I'll just type it in here. Lee Big Stopper. That's the 10-stop the filter that I use. I love it. I absolutely, absolutely love it. So Brian asks, I'm just going to look at some of the questions really quickly. Um, what would I do with an image like this? Not much. Uh, my images, um, ever since I, I, I became a part of On One Software, um, my, everything I do is either for, for you guys, for the, so like these images, when I'm shooting, I'm thinking, can this be applied to a webinar? Or it's just for myself and for my blog. Um, that's it, you know. I don't act. I don't do photography commercially anymore. Um, I, I stopped that once I started with On One. I'm trying to see. Oh, there was a noise question. I saw that. Lori asked, "What about my noise reduction question?" Um, I'm trying to find it, Lori. What your question was? Um, Oh, well, first I see Lori's question asks, um, with a 5D Mark II, how can you set the ISO to 50? <laughs> it's not called 50. If you go to, you, if you hit the ISO button on a 5D Mark II and you go all the way to the left with your, your dial to L, L stands for low, that will register as ISO 50. It's one less than 100 on the thing. I'm trying to find Lori your question about, hey, thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, so Bill's saying that he just ordered one from Adorama because B&H is out of stock. Um, I assume, Bill, you're talking about the promote control. Um, that's good. So guys, uh, check out Adorama too. I wish, can you access HDR Express from Camera Raw or from Bridge? You, I don't know. You could just go to your applications, whether you're Mac or PC, and go to HDR Express. You could just launch it and then go to File Open. But I don't, or you can set it as an external editor, I think. But I don't feel comfortable saying um, uh, that it will work. Oh, uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you for all the kind words. Will we be offering any discounts for On One products? Yes, Carl. I actually do have a discount to give in a minute. I just want to find Lori's question about noise reduction. I can't find it. Um, Lori, can you retype the question? Because a noise reduction is important. Oh, here we go. When do you do noise reduction if you shoot high, at higher ISOs? So, all right. So, Lori's question is when would I do noise reduction if I shoot at higher ISOs? Well, I usually shoot at an ISO 100. Um, I'll shoot at ISO 50 for shots like this, um, long exposure shots. When I'm shooting long exposure, that's exactly what I'm aiming to do, is I'm aiming to get my exposure as long as possible to get a good exposure. Um, the way you can extend your exposure, there are two ways you can do that, um, primarily. You can make your ISO as low as possible, and you can uh, drop your aperture, close it down. Um, both of those things typically re require more time to expose because your sensor is not as sensitive to light and your aperture, uh, the diameter of your aperture is smaller so it takes longer time for the light to hit your sensor. This results in motion, it results in beautiful motion. Um, like today here, this uh, really quickly, this image on my blog was all because of my 10-stop filter. It was at Multnomah Fall in Portland, or outside of Portland, rather. So this is a single exposure, non-HDR, but I wanted the motion of the water. This is about a 30-second exposure at f5. 
Now, you may ask, well, Brian, you just said to drop your aperture, meaning like f22. Why did you shoot at a 5? Because it was raining. And at f22, you would see every raindrop and every single one on my filter. And the filter is just a big piece of glass, so it collects water quickly. But at f5, I was still able to get 30 seconds of exposure because it was still early in the morning where it was kind of dim. And... Um, the water droplets were invisible. So you kind of have to, and this is what Laura's talking about in, indoor HDR. I typically use, um, so here, there's if there is noise, typically with, with um, HDR and a 5D Mark II, you'll probably start seeing noise at about 3200 ISO. Um, it compounds itself with HDR, a single exposure would be better. But what I usually do, let's pretend this sky had noise. I'll send it into Photoshop and I'm going to use a my quick select brush to make a selection around the sky. So I'd clean this up a bit, you know, make sure that the, um, the trees are not selected. You know, make some selections here, whatever the case is, and then I'd use a, um, a noise reduction filter. The reason why I do it in Photoshop is because it will only apply to my selection. It won't put any noise reduction in any other part of the image. Now, typically, I find noise in dark areas, like you're saying, Lori, um, and in skies, because the blue channel is most receptive to noise. So that's exactly what I would do. Um, if you need to use a higher ISO, um, just do that. That's what I would do, and that's, that's really it. Um, oh, <laughs> David, David, so David was asking about cloud motion before, and I went into this whole tangent about how to add blur, but he was talking about something like this, where, let's close this out, so, um, do I have any images, let me see if the brackets here have, um, fast movement, no, you see, I was fortunate that the clouds here were not really moving fast at all, um, Let's see this image if I have cloud movement. No, clouds weren't moving here either. So, um, but actually here, I think maybe the flowers might have been moving. No, just this person over here in the background was moving. But the point is, how do you deal with that? Um, you can, all Pretty much all HDR products now have ghost reduction technologies in them. And so you could actually uh, just apply those. Uh, and it works pretty well. But if it's slow enough movement, you won't even see it. Yeah, buddy, HDR Express is a standalone product. Um, do I ever use a variable ND filter? Nope, Scott, I will stay away from those pretty much because I've seen results that I've not been happy with, crazy vignetting. Variable ND filters allow you to, it's basically like two polarizer filters that you, you kind of um, rotate against each other. And I've seen results where they're not favorable, so no, I don't use them. You're most welcome, David. I'm sorry that I totally misread your question. Um, yeah, ghosting is something you want to avoid. And the only two products that allow you to selectively do ghost reduction, meaning I can, I, I'll select the sky or I'll select this person and do ghost reduction, are Photomatics and um, Photoshop's HDR Pro. They allow you to actually select parts of the image. Um, the other products like HDR Express and whatever, an HDR... Uh, Effects Pro by Nick, they do global noise reduction. They're very effective, but you know you want to experiment. It's really important to experiment. 